is, I mean, here, I, I agree with what you're saying that th it is a mashaka, right? It would definitely cause dif it, it would definitely cause difficulty, but is difficulty enough to remove an obligation? Because uh, difficulty is subjective, right? Yeah. Right. So what the what the scholars did with this hadith is like, okay, well, th there there are a few problems. Number one. Which other hadith do we have that shows the obligation of prayer in congregation? Yes. Not falila, not virtue, but obligation. We don't have a single hadith. We don't have a single hadith showing the obligation of praying in congregation. So what happens now is you have this hadith, and what can be understood from this hadith of Ibn Muktum? That praying in congregation is what? I, it's It's obligatory. Because Ibn Umm Maktoum, the other thing that we didn't mention, we didn't talk about, what is unique about Ibn Umm Maktoum from amongst the companions? Well, there's a few things, but the thing that is very standout. He was what? He was blind, right? <laughs> he, he was blind. So now, imagine you have this situation where the Prophet Sallallahu is addressing a blind man and telling the blind man, you have to go and pray in congregation. And you have all of these hadith. You have all of these hadith that talk about what is the virtue of praying in congregation? What hadith do you guys know? 27, 25, bid'ah, uh, bid'ah 22, depending on how you understand it. So you have these different hadith that say it is better for an individual to pray in jama'ah than praying singularly. So if I have a hadith that says that it's better for me to pray in jama'ah, what does that say about the thing that is lesser? Does that, does that make it, does that mean that this is a sin? No, absolutely not. It shows that in that individual prayer, there's what? There's reward, but it is? It's less. That's all. Right? It just means that it is less. Did we? Uh, yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <sighs> the, there's a hadith of the Munafiqeen where he, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, Had I. Had I been able to, I would have appointed one of you to lead the prayer, and I would have gone and burned down the houses of the people who tukhalif one in jama'ah, you know, those that didn't join the uh, congregational prayer. So, but what's, uh, what do you guys think about that hadith? Sound. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so they're avoiding praying. So why are these people avoiding praying? Because they're lazy? Well, yeah, it is it is laziness, but it's connect the laziness is connected to something else. They're not believers. <laughs> in which group of people are not believers? Uh, the munafiqeen. So here, in most scholars have said this. Most scholars, the pro they they said that this hadith applies to the munafiqeen. Um, so yeah, but I'm saying even the Hanabila, do they say that they say that praying in uh, in congregation is an obligation? But what about praying in the masjid? It's recommended, right? So, um, and and they're they're the s they're the, s the most stringent in that. I don't uh, I don't agree, but alhamdulillah, Make, makes me weak humble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, here, if you have a hadith now that is apparently going against the an encyclopedia of so many other hadith, and you have unique situations because here we just have part of the story. We just have the question and the answer. And are there other things and are there other possibilities that are definitely there? Because in addition to being blind, what was another, um, I would say, another w walifa or another uh, an, an employment that Ibn Muktum had? He was a muaddin nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was actually a person who called the people to adhan. Taib, can the muaddin not go to work? <laughs> right? The muaddin has to go to work. The muaddin has to go to work. So is it possible that he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wasn't telling him in a religious capacity but he was telling him in a professional capacity. Does that make sense? Right. So if he is obligated to go to work, then and where would he, nee especially wha what adhan was he known to give? The fajr. Which 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 fajr adhan? The second one. The second one. Huh? The real the real one. Yeah. Fajr is sadiq. Yeah. Um, so I is these surrounding uh, circumstances make it very a, a very real possibility that he sallallahu alaihi wasallam told him again in a professional capacity not necessarily a religious one so uh, going back 
we have said that there are circumstances that help us understand a hadith, and there are situations where we're not necessarily would act on those hadith. Um, what was the beginning of the discussion? How did I end up here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, ijma. Oh, can ijma? <laughs> can consensus actually abrogate a command of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? And he said, "No, no, no. It's okay." I, the, 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 uh, so the I mean, the discussions are always beneficial. I just have to remember where I why I got there. <laughs> Uh, so understanding that ijma or having consensus, it's not something that can actually abrogate a text. It can't abrogate a saying of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So again, that's another uh, weak argument to stand on. Dave, what is another argument that some scholars use? So the first, the first one, w which I believe to be the strongest, is that is mokuf. That this was Abu Sa'id al Khudri who was actually saying this, and this is not something that was prophetic. He sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't say it. A second one, a second explanation is that this is something that is abrogated. So a third explanation, that the the, f the initial focus should have been what? In, r in terms of writing, right? Because you're now, writing has starting to be, I, w I won't say uh, popularized. Did they, did they have an official script? Like, did the Arab have an official script that they kind of agreed on? Not, not at that point. So you have the Lakhmids, which was the probably the only Arab dynasty that existed even close to that time. They had a script. The Nabataeans had the script. The Yemenis had a script, right? And all of these different scripts, eventually what happened is they actually borrowed a lot from the Nabataean script, and that's what became the final script for them. But when did that become finalized? When did it become codified? And why? What was the big push? The Qur'an. Right, uh huh? During the time of Uthman, right? Because you had people like Abu Aswad al duwali who was appointed and said that, okay, hey, listen, we need to come up with a system in order to actually codify the Quran. And again, but that's that's more of a Quran discussion. But saying that, the important thing to understand is why is that important? Because as as the science of writing in Arabic developed, in parallel, what else happened? People now had a codified system where they could actually what? Start, start recording, and they could start writing. So you had, yeah, I, I. I I, and I use the term loosely, but you had like a proto-written Arabic that was during the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, and in all of these, you have to understand, like even written language, all it is is an expression of what? Spoken spoken word, right? It's an expression of spoken word. And how that manifests can be different according to different tribes and different places uh, because they didn't have a, a unified writing system that had uh, developed up until, uh, until later, right? That didn't come until later. So now you have this extra tool, you have these things going on. And the third explanation here is, uh, and, and this is another good one if you believe the hadith to be marfu'ah, if you believe it to be attributable to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is that he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this because he wanted to busy the companions more so with the writing of the Qur'an versus the writing of his sunnah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So after his death, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have some companions who have their small collections and their small writings. And now the the Quran also when when has it been compiled? Huh, uh, during no no which which Khalifa I want you in it, huh to, during Abu Bakr. So this is immediately after the death of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi and some say a few months after his sallallahu alaihi passing. And why the trigger was Barakat Yamama, right? So there was a battle of Yamama. Many of the Qurra, many of those individuals who recited the Quran. He, Omar radiallahu anhu, he came to Abu Bakr. He's like, hey, listen, we lost all these reciters. We need to what? Like we need to start recording. We got we got to do something about this because if if we keep sending our Qurra out, right? And in the Qurra at at that time. What would happen is like those people who were considered to be the most virtuous were the ones who used to recite the Quran, those who used to spend time with the Quran. And uh, where would these people be in the, in the battalions? Or they'd be in the front lines, right? These, these are like the special forces. These would be the people who actually went forward. And because these were the, the, the greater risk takers versus others, if we start losing them, what was going to happen? We would lose the... You'd lose the text, right? You'd lose the Quran. So at that point, uh, Omar, he came to Abu Bakr and he said to him, hey, listen, this needs to be compiled. Uh, many statements and narrations say that this compilation continued until the end of the Khilafah of Abu Bakr and some say even into the beginning of the Khilafah of Omar radiallahu anhu. So once the compilation was done, that uh, that idea of safety and that the book now is in a in a form that can be referred back to, this is something that became really Im uh, really important and something for them to rely upon. 
So now that that was taken care of, what else was happening in the Ummah at this time? So now we are, we're entering the Khilafah of Umar. And Umar, what does he do? What is one of the unique things that he does? Huh? So expansion is happening during his era, for sure. Like, so the biggest futuhat, the biggest conquests and the biggest expansions, they happen during the Khilafah of Umar radiallahu anh. And every, uh, companions are being sent out, right? Because they're generals and they're being sent out in all these different places. Then after the campaigns are over, what would he to order them to do? O outside of campaigns. So during campaigns, he would what? He would send... As you, you have many... Um, so even like some of the smaller tabi'in. So if we look at like Hassan al-Basri, for example, his meeting with the companions was where? Most of the, most of the hadith that he takes and he gets... Not not from Ali, huh? Most of the <laughs> most of the hadith that he takes, where does he get them from? He gets them from battles. Why? Why? Because he was fighting alongside who? He was fighting alongside com companions. So he would spend time in these campaigns, and this was not strange for the tabi'in. This is not strange for many of the uh, students and the companions that they would actually spend time in campaigns with the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They would spend time with these companions and they would actually go on these campaigns with them. And it's in those campaigns that they would benefit and they would learn these ahadith. So now you have a, a rise of, you have these companions, you have Omar. What he did is like after the campaigns were over, he would do what with the Sahaba? Where he's like, he's like, you know, you, you, uh, they would write to him. They say, hey, can we continue? Can we, can we set up here? He would say what? He would say, no, you need to what? You need to come back to Medina. You need to come back to Medina. You have to come back to Medina. And what are some of the effects of him, radiallahu anh, bringing all of the companions back to Medina? What is one of the benefits that happened? I'm sorry? Uh, so the knowledge now has become bottlenecked into one place. How, how does that benefit? Right, it becomes extremely difficult to fabricate narrations. It's very, b why? Because now you have... If I hear a hadith in Basra, if I hear a hadith in Kufa, if I hear a hadith in Egypt, how much can I rely on those narrations at this stage? I, you can't. You'd be like, well, there's nobody here, right? None of the companions are here. Nobody settled here. Like, where did you, where did you hear this from? And that filtration system had become bottlenecked in Medina, right? It became very easily er verified. And not just that, the Khilafah of Omar, it was the second longest Khilafah. It was the second longest Khilafah. Abu Bakr was 12 and a half years. Omar was? And, right? And, uh, one was 12, 12 and a half, right? And then the, the last six were Ali, and the last six months were, were Hassan, radiallahu anhum. So the, you have this bottleneck that's there. The other thing that happens is now that you've confined the knowledge there, a lot of the ijma'at, so a lot of the consensus, where is it going to happen? It's going to happen in Medina. Right? It's easy. It's easy to do that because all the scholars are where? All right, they're all Dara Hijra. Yeah, the, the Prophet made Hijrah from Mecca to Medina, right? The original Dar al not, not like Dar al uh, Falls Church. <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, and s side note, I, I never thought I would graduate from Mecca to become the Imam at Dar al Hijrah. It's, inter it's, it's interesting, right? So, uh, <laughs> uh, so can, can I can I be Imam Har Imam Haramain or yet? <laughs> So uh, we have here now, during the time of Umar, we have this consensus. We have the scholars, all of them gathered. All of the companions are in there. And you have the younger companions. Who are they spending time with? They're spending time with the older companions. Two very famous ones come to mind. That they become from the Mukathiri and the Saba. They become from the, s the seven great narrators of the prophetic hadith. Who are they? Ha, huh? Abdullah ibn Umar. And Abdullah ibn Abbas. Young. Both of these guys are young. And not just that, from them, there's, I mean, there's another companion, but he narrates hadith because the Prophet ﷺ made the offer him. Who was that? He was, uh, he was also young, and he only spent a handful of years. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira. So Abu Huraira, when did he become Muslim, and when did he start uh, hearing from the Prophet ﷺ? Khaybar, right? Like, uh, Khaybar. And Khaybar was like two, three years before the Prophet ﷺ passed. But saying that, you have the younger companions now. Ibn Omar, he's being raised around, he's raised in Medina. Medina is a city of companions, right? If, if I wanted to learn anything at that era of, of, the, uh, of the Islamic empire, I would go where? I, I would go to Hijrah. I would, like, I would go to uh, Dar al-Hijrah, I would go to Mecca. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I would go to Medina because that's where the companions were. Did they ha were there companions in Mecca still? 
yeah, there are still companions in Mecca. Um, you you had uh, I think uh, who moved to Taif? One of the companions moved to Taif, but they they all stayed within the area, right? They didn't they didn't go too far. Uh, most of the companions had settled in Medina by that point. Um, so here you have hadith coming out from that space, and you have coming out from from that area, and then Omar radiAllahu anhu he's assassinated, and then Uthman comes to power, and what does Uthman do that's unique? What does he do that's different than what Omar did? I'm sorry. So he he distributed the Quran because now what had happened is, after all of this expansion, how much expansion happened during Uthman's era, during his Khilafah? There were some, there were some, but it was in comparison to other uh, the expansion was very what? It was very limited, right? It was limited in t in when you compare it to the other expansions that happened. Like it happened, so they moved a little bit into Azerbaijan. They moved a little bit toward the Caspian Sea, and they opened up a little, you know, so they had some more conquests that happened in those areas. But the conquests were nowhere near as, as large. They so now that the conquests stop, what happens to the soldiers? Right, they, they kind of stay. And now that you've concentrated the conquests into specific areas, all of those soldiers that were spread out, now they're what? Now they start concentrating into these specific places where you're looking for either conquest or you're looking for border patrol or for protection. And because you uh, you focus on these two places, all of these soldiers that had never met before, now they finally have an opportunity to what? To meet. And from those soldiers, you have people who are Qur'a. From those soldiers, you have people who are reciting the Qur'an. And how, were they, how did they learn their recitation? From, from different companions. Right, because they remember we were talking about they were on different campaigns. So usually on a campaign they would accompany one or two companions in that entire campaign, moving in this direction, moving in this direction, moving in this direction. And then what happened during the Khilafah of uh, Uthman is now they're starting to come together and now that they are reciting in different ways, what's happening? Right, there's differences and, and all of us immediately with differences, how do we deal with differences? Do we deal with do we do a good job as Muslims? Right. In general, we don't do a good job. And when I, if I say, okay, well, the way that I recite is what? That's the right way, right? That's the best way to do it. And this guy is like, nah, this is, I learned it this way. I heard, I, I heard this from Ibn Masood. And this person is like, no, I heard this way from Ibn Abbas. And they're reciting Quran in their particular, or I heard this from Ali. So they have their recitations and they're saying, okay, no, this is my mustanad. This is how I learned it. This is the right way to do it. So, and what happens is now Uthman, he gets word of this. He's like, man, the Qur'a are fighting. The Qur'a are fighting. And uh, so what does he do? He's like, okay, no. We need one system now. And he does, he does something that he codifies the Qur'an. He says, no, this. This is the final Mus'haf. And it's known as Mus'haf al-Imam. And he sends it out to the different Amsar. Right? So he, most scholars will say that he sent it out to five different provinces. And he said, this is what we're going to read. This is how we're going to continue going. This is how we're going to read. At the same time, what else is happening in the Ummah? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, he, so th it can be argued that Abu Bakr's preservation was not a state-imposed preservation. It was closer to a, like a... Uh, y like, a like a spiritual, personal-type preservation because he didn't impose that on anyone versus Uthman's Uthman he was like and w what was the reason he was doing it he, he wanted to get rid of the infighting and he was like okay we're just going to come on one system now and w once it became codified th why were the other Muslim ordered to be burnt for that purpose um, that, that's all and Allah knows best so at the same time what else is happening in the, in the, in the Muslim empire we have something new during the era of Uthman that we didn't have to deal with in the era of Umar Huh? The Khawarij? Okay. They were, and were they there during the uh, Khilafah of Omar? Huh? They were, but they were. They, they, were, uh, they were under thumb, right? They were, they were being held back and held down. During the era of Uthman, these, these individuals and these groups, they started what? They started rising and they started making an appearance. The most famous of them, the Khawarij. Who else? The Shia. The Shia also rose in this time period. So now that you have the rise of these of these different sects, what other problem is being introduced? Because th there's something else that happened too. You had the rise of sects and sectarianism. What else happened 
So we said these battles happen. He was like, he, he's trying to quell all these fires, right? That's what Uthman was trying to do. He was trying to put out all these fires. But he had one additional problem. So during the era of Omar, we said, where, where were the companions? <laughs> they, were, huh? they were in Dar al-Hijra. They were in Medina. Tayyip. And during the Khilafah of Uthman, where did what happened to the companions? They started spreading out now. They're like, okay, well, if we don't have to stay, we're going to go on these campaigns. And we're going to go give da'wah, and we're going to go teach, and we're going to go set up centers. So now the knowledge is no longer confined to to, to one place. Saying that, if and just this is just human nature, where did most of the companions go? So if you have, if we have like a hundred percent of the companions, they start, or even ninety-eight percent of the companions started in Medina. What percentage of them do you think left? Huh? Yeah, maybe like half of them, right? M meaning that this remaining half, where did they go? They went to all of the different provinces. So if we spread that, if we're spreading that fifty percent off into the different provinces, where are most of the companions? They're still in Medina. They're still in Medina, which is why when we talk, when we got into the science of actually criticizing narrators and doing all these things, it didn't start in Medina. Why? Because you too, like people were known, right? You still had you had still had like grandkids of companions around, and uh, and not to say like you know the righteousness is inherited. That that's not the that's not the purpose and that's not the point, but you still had companions around. Right, you still had companions around, and they were just—they were the ones who were walking in the streets. I, it wasn't like other places where you only had like a handful. You actually had a good number of companions that stayed in Medina, and because you had so many, it became—it's much more difficult to do what in Medina than it would be in other places, to fabricate. Why? Because immediately, what would happen? They shut you down. They'll immediately shut you down. No, no, he didn't say that. And not just that, like such people, would they be able to thrive in such an environment? No, absolutely not. Which is why you don't, ha again, you don't have a lot of hadith criticism happening in Medina. You don't have a lot of uh, narrator criticism happening in Medina because th the ability for them to even do that was very limited. It was very problematic. So you, you have that going on. You have companions in other places. You have sectarianism happening. And now this gives rise to what? Okay, it gives rise to the sciences that we're talking about. Right, you ha we have to respond to these problems. But what problem has arisen that we didn't have to deal with previously? Fabrication. Because now you have people fabricating hadith. Why are they fabricating? Because, huh, because either for political motives or for? Huh? Well, to, to, to make money wasn't a problem. But wh what other one? For for uh, status, right? So we can that can go back to political, or well, there are two ways to gain status. I can either gain status politically or what? Scholarly, religious status. So these were the mainly the two reasons why people would do that. So religiously, either because I'm misusing the deen, which is one possibility, or I actually what? Because not, not everybody has was ill willed. Not everybody was doing it purposely. Uh, out of encouragement, yeah, th that, th those people existed too. No, you're right, but but I'm talking about like the, the, the like a Khariji or a Shi'i or a Qadari or a Murji. Why would they? Why would they do that? Because they believe what? They they believe that this is right. They believe that this is right. So it's not necessary that they fabricate a hadith, but is it possible that they would take a hadith and they would they would misrepresent it or misconstrue it? without realizing that they're doing it because they believe this is the right way to understand and the right way to uh, to project? Right, they, they misunderstood. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so you, you have, like, and, and this is what happens, right? You have people where uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't given them tawfiq. He hasn't blessed them in understanding, you know, a particular thing in the right way. But if this individual, as a Muslim, he believes this is right, how is he going to represent the hadith? He's, he's going to push his agenda, right? He's going to have his bias that's in there. And then this is something that is going to be natural, even for the person who is most, even if he's sincere. And how do we know that some of these people were sincere? Sometimes they would narrate hadith that were what? They were contrary to what they believed. Just think about that. It, it just shows how sincere and honest many of these narrators were. 
that they were willing to narrate hadith uh, that were actually contradictory to what they believed. How did they deal with those hadith? They would do ta'weel, or they would try to explain it away, or they would interpret it in, in a different way. But at the end of the day, they were willing to do that. Why? Because they didn't want to be known, and they didn't want to lie on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is, this is all, this, these are all the things that are happening. You have the rise of the tabi'een, right? Because now we're moving, as we move further in time, the companions are what? Not, not just spreading out. There's a, something else. They're dying, right? <laughs> you know, they're, they're passing away. They're, they're all dying. They're passing away. And the next generation is starting to inherit. And we said that in the next generation in the tabi'een, that split, we split them into three categories. What are the three major categories of the tabi'een? Ah. So uh, e either all or a majority of their teachers were companions. Okay. And, the, and the on the other end, right, they would just have one or two who were their teachers. And then we had who? That th there's only th ah, there has to be in the middle, right? It's like it's like e either either all or one, right? <laughs> so there were these were the three levels, right? So kibar tabi'in, also the tabi'in, and sigar tabi'in, right? And these were all the levels uh, of the tabi'in, and this is how they recorded, and this is how they carried it forward. And we said at the same time, like now they're they're starting to do what? By them sitting with the companions, what are they sitting and what are they learning? Right, they're, they're learning about narration, right? They're taking statements of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sometimes a, a companion would also give what? He would, gi he would give his own ishtihad, he would give his own fatwa. And what were they doing? They were, they were recording, right? Either through memory or they would be writing it down, right? These are the only two ways that they would actually record. And by doing this, they would, r they would record, they would write it down. And you have the rise of suhuf, right? So you have the rise of these small booklets that had started right you have Sahih al Sahiha and a few other booklets that were recorded by like uh what were some of the ones that we mentioned last time? <coughs> where the where are the early ones? Uh here. Uh Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, uh Abi Salama Nabi ibn al Sharit al Kufi and Hamam ibn Munabbi. Uh, these are the three earliest compilations that we actually have. And you start having these compilations um, where you have the, the tabi'in recording from some of the companions. What happens to these books? Or what happened to these books? Right, right these, these actually became incorporated into larger books. These actually became incorporated into larger books. Um, and then we have the next era, which is the golden age of compilation. So what do you think the golden age of compilation is? What do, we f what do you think we're going to find in this era in this time? I'm sorry? Can you ask about what? Chad Chu? I have no idea what you're saying. Oh, can you ask AI? I mean, yeah, I mean, listen, you can, you can ask whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, his muatta. His motto was very early because Imam Malik, he died 189, right? So you're, you're talking about even if he did it like 20, 30 years before he died. Yeah. So, uh, so, so the golden age now, they're a little bit later because like Imam Malik, he died before all of them, right? He was, he was very early. But after that, like you're, you're talking about maybe like 80, 70, 80 years after them, then you have these scholars. And who are, who are these scholars during this golden age? Very famously, ha, Muhammad ibn Ismail, ha, <laughs> ibn Mughira, ibn Bardizba, al Bukhari. Um, and this, and where are these scholars from? You'll find them from all different parts of the Muslim Ummah. And um, and and, and what, what's what's really interesting is that we, we see this happening, right? We see this happening where we have scholars from who are not Arab now taking on positions of imama, right? Like these are actually imams and considered religious figureheads in Islam. And th this is like, for, for somebody who studies history or spends time looking at other religions, this is, this is like really, it's like game changing. This is such a big thing. Even today, even today, amongst the Muslims, do you have one central Muslim authority? No. For some people, right? No, no, I, wh which is fine, but I'm saying, 
you have you have an authority that will be respected by those people, but will how will other people view that authority? R right, they'll they'll respect it, but they're going to be like, I don't need to, right? Or they might they might not, right? <laughs> but I don't need to listen to that. So even today, there you have in in Indonesia, you have two major Muslim groups. Like you have Nadwa Ulama and you have someone else. In Pakistan, you have you have Dar al the Khalij, the Gulf, they've well, uh, they've kind of split now, right, with Qatar and Saudi <laughs> But they they have they have their own marja. Even in Iran, right? They're Muslim, like granted they're not Sunni, but they have their own. Even amongst them, even amongst them, you have the Usulis and the Akhbaris. So even they don't agree on that. And if we say, oh no, it's it's a Madhab thing, no, the 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 Hanafis in the Indo Pak region are very different from the Hanafis in the Syrian region. So you have all of these different authoritative groups, right? Not, not in the sense that they impose on others, but in the sense that they're recognized. And they're all from different regions. Yes. Oh, is it, is it appropriate? For yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, like, I Islam came to bring Nidlam, right? Islam came to bring regiment. It came to bring um, order. So to have like these organized institutions is something that's really important. Without organization, there's no there's no way to move forward. But is it is it something that is necessary for me as an individual to abide to? Like because these are none of these are um, none of these are political bodies. They're what? They're religious ones, right? They're religious bodies. So even here in the United States, you have you have like two or three major religious bodies. You get do you guys are you guys familiar? Well, there might even be more. I'm not familiar with all of them, honestly, huh? Uh, like so, I it's not as more of like a Muslim social platform than it is like a religious authoritative one. Like fiqh councils, right? So you have Amja, you have um, what's the was it North American Fiqh Council is another one. I think Dar al they have their own they have their own fiqh councils. Um, but these other than these like major like three four, I'm sure there are more than this. At the end of the day, if if Amja, and let's just use that as an example. They say, okay, concerning this issue, we don't think it's permissible. Am I, am I, do I have to abide by that ruling as an individual? No, I, I, I don't. I'm sorry? So I, th I think a lot of the, I think a lot of the Arab, uh, Arab American Muslims do. Outside of that, no, not, not really. Yeah. No, no, not even less, right? Because Arab, Ar Ar Arabs in general, what percentage of the Muslim population are they? It's like seventeen percent. But even even in America, it's like mostly Egyptian, right? Um, like mo like most of the Arab representation are Egyptian. Um, I don't I don't li yeah, but it's small, right? It's not it's not that it's not that big. Uh, saying that, like you you have all kinds, and not not just that. Like within within the Black Americans, they have their own institutions. Um, the even amongst the immigrants, like you have splits amongst them about who they recognize, who their own institutions are. Some of them don't even recognize any of the American institutions, and they still rely on a lot of the foreign institutions that they were either a part of or they associate themselves with. So, you know, again, these are not authoritative bodies. These are religious bodies that exist that are meant to give ifshad. They're meant to give guidance. They're meant to give um, uh, like direction. They're meant to give insight into certain things. But as an individual Muslim, am I obligated to follow? This body or that body or this consent? No, no, that's not not necessarily. Uh, should I benefit and, res and respect them? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And they're they're doing work that we're not doing, right? They're doing work that whether I agree with it or not, um, as long as they have a methodology in place that's very clear, then it's something that we should definitely respect. So here you have uh, a lot of Muslims from these different parts of the Muslim world now who are coming together and they're writing a hadith, uh, Bukhara. Qurtuba and Ishbilia, you guys know where these places are? They're in Spain. They're in Spain. Sana'a and uh, Aden, where is that? In Yemen. And Mecca and Medina, obviously, the well known. <sighs> and you in this era, you have different types of compilation happening. So, companion based, do you guys know what kind of uh, hadith those are called or what compilations those are? If These are called Masanid, right? So, this is called Musnad. So, if you look, for example, what is the most famous Musnad? Imam Ahmed. So Musnad Imam Ahmed. <laughs> Musnad Imam Ahmed. Wh how how does he organize it? He organizes it by companions, right? He organizes by companion, meaning which hadith did that particular companion narrate? Also, you have topic-based hadith. What do we mean by topic-based hadith? Yeah. So halal haram even more 
like even yes so like marriage prayer fasting it's so like th these different topics what would happen is that you'd actually have either entire compilations uh, the most famous even during the time of Imam Ahmad you have the Musannafat right so you have Musannaf Abdul Razak Musannaf Ibn Ami Sheba uh, you have Al Ausat the Ibn Mundir so these are all very famous hadith books that were compiled during the time the problem with those works is they're extremely what they're really large they're really long but if you compare them, for example, to Sahih Bukhari or Sahih Muslim or Sunan Abi Dawood or Ibn Majah, those are much shorter works comparatively. Why? Okay, si yes, but what was sifted? So the earlier works, like during the time of Imam Ahmed, you have like these musannafat, you have like these really, really long topic-based works. And even a lot of those books, what happens was like those... Sometimes the chapter headings even. So you'd have chapter headings and hadith. They'd be pulled and they'd be brought into the next generation book. So the question is like, okay, what happened here? There was a sifting that happened, which I agree with. But what kind of sifting happened? What was unique uh, in the following generation? What happened? There, there are two layers to it. I'm sorry? They removed repetition? So that, that's actually a really good guess, but no. I'm sorry. Strength. So now, now you have the first, the first two famous books that we're aware of. They've they put a condition of what? That it be Sahih, right? That that it be Sahih. So this was for one type of sifting. What else happened? Mm. They all had chains, even in the previous generations. The chains had already been introduced. So the difference between the Musannafat and even in the Muatta, let's even bring Muatta into, into this. What is different from the Muatta than from the books that come later? What is different from the Musannafat from the books that come later? Ah, Ahsant. So in the Musannafat, you don't just find hadith. You find what else? You find sayings from the companions. You find fatawa, right? Even from some scholars. Like they're they're much, much more encyclopedic in their scope. Because even if you look at the Muatta of Imam Malik, it's not all what? It's not all a hadith. Right? He'll, he'll bring some statements. He'll even he, sometimes he'll give his own what? Fatawa. But when we got, now when you enter the, the, the next era and the next stage, they, 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 ruled, they brought only authenticity. And what else did they bring? Only a hadith. Like they said, we are only going to focus on what he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said. And that's what was unique in the following generations. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Uh huh. That wasn't their goal. Yeah. So, Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, their goal was actually authenticity. That was their goal, and they they had said that out. Why? So, for Imam Bukhari, as when we'll get to it, he was actually requested. He was actually requested by one of his teachers say that had you gathered all of the authentic statements on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he was asking him to do two things, and he, he said this. And the Imam Muslim in his muqaddima, what is one of the goals that he's like? I only want to bring what, Sahih. Yeah. So, so and, and what we can we can talk about those two. So Imam Tirmidhi, that was not his goal, right? He 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 makes that clear when he does his hukum on the hadith itself. Right, so sometimes it's clear, like, okay, well, he doesn't even think this hadith is sound. Nasa'i and Abu Dawood are a little bit more challenging. Abu Dawood, he writes in his letter to the people of Mecca, فَمَا سَكَتُّ عَنْهُ فَهُوَ صَالِحُ So it's like, whatever I'm silent about, then that hadith is salih. Now, what does he mean by salih? Does he mean salih, the ihtijaj or i'tibar? Does it mean that this can be used as a, a standalone proof in and of itself? Or is it something that can be used as a supporting proof? Debatable. Uh, and then Ibn Majah, I, one of my professors actually pointed me to a, I think it was a ma the PhD thesis on Ibn Majah. Like it was called Ibn Majah wa Manhaju. Like Ibn Majah and his methodology in co his compilation. And he said that one of the titles he found for Ibn Majah was As Sunan wal Gara'ib. That Sunan and unique ahadith. So you'll find that. It, it j just by having that title, it changes your entire perception on how to deal with the book. 
because his goal was also not to do what? To bring everything that's sahih. He, he actually, what his, he purposely does what? Brings a hadith that are unique, right? And, and not, like not, not meant to be, because uniqueness is one of the first step steps toward what? Uh, yeah, th toward, toward weakness, toward weakness. Khalas, there's only a couple minutes till salah. I'm, I'm sorry, we don't we don't have time for questions. If you have any, just uh, write them down, inshallah, and I'll, I'll take them next week, bi ta'ala. Um, also, if you guys haven't had a chance to take a survey, please take the survey. I'd really appreciate it. It helps me uh, develop new classes, bi ta'ala. But we, we do have two classes, inshallah, that will be starting at the beginning of the year that I'm pretty sure you guys will be excited about. Yeah. No, no, it was, it was one, one is confirmed. The second one we're working on. <laughs>